Uh, welcome to St. Elizabeth Catholic Community in Port Natchez, Texas. My name is Alan Runty. Uh, I will be facilitating today's scripture study. Uh, today is the uh, second Sunday in Lent in Cycle C. Our first reading is from Genesis, so we're going to start out in really the very beginning of the Bible, and then we move on to a letter from St. Paul uh, to the Philippians, uh, and then we uh, continue in, gospel, in the uh, Gospel of Luke. So let's uh, start with an opening prayer. Uh, this prayer is for a good Lent. Um, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Look with favor, Lord, on your household. Grant that, though our flesh be humbled by abstinence from food, our souls, hungering after you, may be resplendent in your sight. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's a, a prayer I found by Pope Pius V. Um, so uh, in, in today's first reading, um, God makes his first covenant with Abram, uh, which was the promised land to Abram's descendants. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today because um, Abram didn't have any descendants at this time. Um, and then the second reading, uh, St. Paul warns about the false teachers and encourages the church uh, to stay true to the teachings of Christ. And then in the gospel today, uh, we're going to, uh, it's the story of the transfiguration of Christ uh, on the mountain. So uh, a little background on our first reading today. Uh, it's been about 10 years since God called Abram to take his family uh, and leave Haran. Uh, and this is still when Abram was Abram and not Abraham yet. Um, God told uh, Abram that he would make him a great nation. Uh, and, and that connotation, what he's talking about, the great nation, is he would be the head of, a, of his people, which meant his descendants. Not just the Jews or, and the Hebrews, but it would be actually his descendants. Um, and uh, so I want to uh, read, give you some background on that. Um, and so from, uh, from Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 4, this is when Abram received the call from, uh, from God. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from the land of your kinsfolk and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the communities of the earth shall find blessing in you. Abram went as the Lord directed him, and Lot went with him. Lot was his nephew. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. So that, that leads up to our, uh, uh, the lead-in today uh, on this covenant that God is going to make with Abram about his descendants. Um, and uh, now at this point, right immediately before the story, Abram questions God concerning how this kingdom, these gifts can actually occur because he doesn't have any children, he doesn't have any offsprings. And so leading up immediately to it is um, Genesis 15 verses 1, verses uh, 2 through 4. But Abram said, O Lord God, what good will your gifts be if I keep on being childless and have as my heir the steward of my house, Eliezer? Abram continued, See, you have given me no offspring, and so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, No, that one shall not be your heir. Your own issue shall be your heir. Now at this point, Abram is around 85 years old, okay? And he's still, and he's still childless. Um, so the first reading um, from Genesis. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if you can. Just so, he added, shall your descendants be. Abram put his faith in the Lord, who credited it to him as an act of righteousness. He then said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you the land as a possession. O oh Lord God, he asked, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He answered him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old she-goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these, split them in two, and placed each half opposite the other. But the birds he did not cut up. Birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses, but Abram stayed with them. As the sun was about to set, a trance fell upon Abram, and a deep, terrifying darkness enveloped him. When the sun had set and it was dark, 
there appeared a smoking brazier and a flaming torch which passed between those pieces. It was on that occasion that the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land from the wide eye of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. So, um, so in this reading, um, God hears Abram's plea and responds more directly than he did in Genesis 12 uh, that we just heard, 1 through 3, where he just called him and said, Go, here's where it's good. You know, follow me. You're going to be the leader of a great nation. In this case, he says, your actual descendants are going to inherit this. So in, in, inherit this land um, if you're true to me. Well, um, um, so looking up at the stars, uh, looking up at the sky and count the stars, uh, you know, something that we, we clearly can't do, but that had to be an overwhelming amount of uh, information for Abram to digest because here he is, he's 85 years old, he has no descendants, okay? he, has no, he doesn't have a single child, and yet God's saying, look up at the sky, this is how big your family will ultimately be, your descendants. <clears throat> Took an incredible amount of faith, right, for him to believe that God was actually going to provide that. And so, in order to do that, we move forward in this, in this reading, and God actually enters into a covenant. It wasn't the, the first in, in chapter 12, it was a call, right? I call you to go do this. Abram had faith, okay? Now God is going to enter into a covenant with Abram, okay, which has much more implications, right, for, uh, uh, for us, for God, and we're going to see that still continues today. In verse 6 says, Abram put his faith in the Lord, who credited it to him as an act of righteousness. Um, what does is, what is credited mean? Would it be uh, why this is happening to him? Because he was uh, righteous, had been a righteous man? Like, um, gosh. But actually credited it. I mean, what, so, so when blessed something's... Him. Blessed him. Yeah, blessed him. He, in, in this context, he earned it, right? I mean, if you're, if you're, you're credited mm -hmm. a pay if you earn it. Right? You go to work, you get credited. They don't debit it from you. You're credited something. And so this righteousness was credited to Abram because he had believed okay, before this covenant. And, and we know that the, uh, well, we're going to get to this in a minute, but he, um, Abram did everything that God asked him to do, right? It, even though it didn't make mortal sense to him and it didn't seem very, it didn't seem completely logical of what he was promising, he did it anyway. And so it was, he, he actually, um, he actually earned the righteousness that God placed in him. And then in verse nine, God initiates the covenant uh, with Abram. So I'm gonna go back to that and says, so he said, he answered him, bring me a three-year-old uh, heifer, a three-year-old she-goat through a ram. And then says, he brought them, split them in two and placed each half opposite the others. So that's actually, that and we've seen we've seen that offering that sacrifice several times where where people initiated that um, that 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 sacrifice that slaughter and that's how covenants were done in that time right so the splitting of animals was more than just sacrificial the 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 practice was go ahead I'm yes sorry but others only did one animal didn't they or it, was no it I mean there was always no, I mean, it was different. Yeah, it, it, sometimes it was one, sometimes it was a bull, sometimes oh, okay. it wasn't, yeah. But, but that, that practice was more than just a ornamental or sacrificial. It actually split the, split the animal and place it on two sides, and then the two parties would pass between, between the, the slaughtered animals, between those two halves. And the reason they did that was because they agreed. It was such a, such a strong contract between the two individuals that if I entered into a covenant oh, okay. with you and, 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 and proceeded through the middle of those slaughtered, <clears throat> sacrificed animals, then I was agreeing that if I defaulted, that I would suffer the same fate. So it was more than just like our altar Correct. where the animals were. It was like there's a an altar here and an altar here. There, there's, there's a, there was just a gap. I don't know. I don't know that it had to be prophetic. It could have been laid on the ground. It was more than just symbolic, though. 
that would actually pass in between the animals. So, and that would be like bringing them together. It would be like, I, it, the, the whole connotation was, was that if I default, I'm willing, I'm so committed to this covenant, to this contract, to this agreement, that if I fail to uphold my part, then I'm willing to have the same fate that the animals that I slaughtered, right? That, that's, that was the, that's how strong oh. the covenant was, okay? So we still hear that today. Anybody ever cut a deal or cut a contract <clears throat> with somebody? That's, that's, that's the root. That's where, this, that's where this began, right? And it's, it's continued all the way through now to, to cut a deal, to cut a contract, is literally split those, split those animals and again, agree that if I default, it's the, I, I'll, I'll pass the same fate. So what did the smoking brazier and flaming torch represent then in verse 17? No, it's, yeah, it's anybody else. Yeah, it's it's God, just like the burning, you know, appearing in the burning bush, right? I mean, God often uh, or, or several times appeared in the form of something burning, a flame, right? And so that was that that was the was God passing between the animals, sealing that covenant with. When Abraham. he brought them out of Egypt, it was either the smoke or the flame. One right. was during the day, one, one was, was at night. night. Right. Yeah. But both of them in the covenant. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's that just how strong this covenant is. Well, Abram would have understood that because that's that was the norm, that was the practice of the covenant. And then to see the you know, he was in a he he was kind of in a fog, he was uh, he was in trance. You know, I'm not sure if that came before, during, or after, but I can't imagine what he must have thought of that. Um, when when that occurred, but he had to have that faith that it was that that God was true to him. And, and remember, leading up to this, he had gone uh, right before this. He had actually God had supported him in defeating the four kings who had defeated the five kings whenever they captured Lot. And then he, with three hundred and some odd, less than four hundred men, he went and he went and defeated the armies of four kings to bring Lot back. We could only do that with God's favor. So he knew and he put his faith in God. There's so many stories throughout that this, this first section of Genesis where Abram did that, that it, it's, um, that he, he, I think he already had that faith. God really sealed it with this, with this covenant with him. And, and we still see this today, right? I mean, we know the Israelis and the Palestine, uh, the Palestinians are still fighting over this land, right? I mean, but, and, and this is, this is what they use. Okay, to say this is our land. You know, this covenant was, I mean, why? Because, because of the covenant that he made with Abram and said, this shall be your land. Right? And they, so they take it very, very seriously. Yeah. Um, so um, why, why use this reading in Lent? Yeah, we know, we know we have that. Anybody, yeah. Brenda? Yeah. In the beginning of this covenant is going to be um, concluded with uh, Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, the new covenant. He, he came to fulfill the old covenant. He represents the new covenant. Right. He represents the, um, the fulfillment of the beginning of this relationship all the way back in Genesis with um, the Israelites mm -hmm. carried through to... Um, Right, exactly. Yeah, this is the example of the old covenant, the sacrifices that occurred in the old covenant, the new covenant that that we'll that we get with Jesus Christ, and His passion and sacrifice and death. Right, it it puts aside these this old form of sealing a covenant. Right, the covenant with God that we have now, and the new covenant we have with God is the sacrifice of His Son, the Lamb of God. Right, and who will take away our sins, right? And so that's this. So that that's this. The the difference is to show a difference between 
what the old covenants were and what the what the new covenant is. But so yeah, very basis very good. Of, of, of this this covenant that he started, they always had to do a sacrifice with animals. That was Something. The center of that covenant was they had to make a sacrifice because of their sinful nature. They constantly had Correct. to do this. Yeah. But with <clears throat> Christ making the complete sacrifice, that's no longer. Necessary. It's no longer required. It's no longer required. Right, right, so, yeah. Yeah, and so that's that to show did that. Did actually that's... stop after that, or did it take quite a few years to stop? I mean, um, did all Jewish people stop? No. No, no they didn't. No, they did not. And that was all some of the things that St. Paul, that they had a problem, that St. Paul had a problem with oftentimes. And it doesn't say it in today's readings, in, in specifically in today's uh, second reading, um, but there was still that problem of teachers that were mixing the new covenant and what Christ's teachings were with the old laws. Right? I mean, that, and, and as a matter of fact, the gospel, I think we can, we'll touch upon a little bit of that in the gospel reading today in the transfiguration with Moses and Elijah. So what, you know, why did they, why did they appear and why did they disappear? Yep. But I'm, instead of digressing like normal, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. So. I think like Hebrews yeah. talks a lot about perfect sacrifice, which is yeah. Christ. Right. Uh, yeah. No need for uh, <clears throat> any other sacrifice. Right, that the ultimate sacrifice has been made. The and the sacrifices sacrifice. had to be made in the temple in Jerusalem. They couldn't be made in the synagogue. So when the temple is destroyed, mm -hmm. there'll be no place where they can do the, uh, the sacrifice. Right, yeah, good point. Street. Right, so that's right. Why that can't eventually happen. Happen. Yeah. 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 happen when... Uh, the temple is destroyed again after Jesus. So. And remember, that was a rule that the that's a rule that the the Hebrews decided, not in Hebrews, but the Hebrew that the Israelites decided <laughs> that it had to be in the temple exactly. because originally there was no there wasn't a temple, right? And so, yeah, and and so that's one of the things that Jesus really fights and that Paul fights is move away from these old rules that were made by man. This is the new rule. This is the new order. <clears throat> So our second reading uh, comes from uh, St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Um, another one of the letters that he wrote while he was in prison. Um, he had a uh, St. Paul had a great relationship with the people of, of Philippi. Um, in um, uh, Philippians one three through five, St. Paul recognizes their strong faith. And that wasn't always the case, like in the case of the Corinthians, right? I mean, where it, where he was, he had to do almost do battle with them to get them to convert. That was not the case here, and, and uh, Philippians begins, uh, and this is um, uh, 1, 3 through 5. Um, I give thanks to my God at every remembrance of you, praying always with joy in my every prayer for all of you because of your partnership for the gospel from the first day until now. And so there was a very, very strong church community there. Uh, uh, and then um, chapter 3, though, begins by strongly calling out those among the Philippians <coughs> Uh, they're not staying true to the teachings of Christ, and and what and and what they're doing is they're merging the Jewish laws and the Jewish beliefs with the with what the new law and the new covenant is, and there's they're they're creating some dissent. It's not as bad as in some of the some of the communities, but he's starting to see that he's he's, he's getting feedback. Actually, he's not see getting feedback that this is occurring, and so. Um, in 3, 2, it begins, uh, Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 2, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the mutilation. It's that mutilation. It's that mutilation of the truth, right? So they're not actually killing anything, right? They're mutilating the purity of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Where is Philippi? Philippi? Uh, Philippi? Philippi. Philippi. Greece. Yeah, yeah, Greece. Greece. Yeah, yeah, far, yeah, east. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's Greece. The north of the, the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so our second reading, join with the others in being imitators of me, brothers and sisters, and observe those who conduct themselves according to the model you have in us. For many, as I have often told you and not tell you even in tears, conduct them conduct themselves as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Their minds are occupied with earthly things. 
but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we also await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will change our lowly body to conform with his glorified body by the power that enables him also to bring all things into subjection to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, beloved. So you can tell there in this closing even, I mean, he, he has a strong love uh, for, the, for this community. So um, join with the others in being imitators of me, brothers and sisters, and observe those who conduct themselves according to the model you have in us. Um, what, what does St. Paul mean by being an imitator of him? I mean, it seems like a fairly arrogant statement, right? Well, Christ isn't there anymore. Right. And he has changed so much. Christ had changed him so much that see what Christ has done to me. This is what. Right. Yeah. It's not a statement of arrogance. The people that the, the, the followers, Paul's, those who know Paul, okay, know that it's not an arrogant statement, that it is the truth, that this, that I am imitating Jesus Christ for what I know and for what I truly believe and what has, the Holy Spirit has placed in me, even though he never knew Jesus, right? He didn't personally know Jesus. He became, came to know Jesus through the Holy Spirit, right? And so we can do the same thing. I mean, that's really that call. We, we can do the same thing, but it's really, you know, and, and stick to the teachings of Christ in this new church, okay? We need to move away from the move away from the old laws and this is the laws that we need the law that we need to find I mean, that we need to follow and then uh, in verse 18 um, it's uh, for many as I've often told you tell you in tears conduct themselves as enemies of the cross of Christ so an enemy of the cross of Christ is anyone who doesn't believe in the resurrection of Christ so it's really they there were there were there were people then, there's still people now, we know that do not believe that this occurred, right? It's fundamental to the foundation of our belief, right? That Christ died and rose again from the dead and then ascended into heaven, right? And so the people that don't believe that are enemies of the cross, enemies of Christ, enemies of the church, right? And that's really, yes? And what we, a few weeks ago, we had all those readings in 1 Corinthians dealing mm -hmm. with this issue of the resurrection of Christ because there were people in Corinth who were, you know, doubting that Christ had been resurrected. And so he, right. he gives all these examples of people that he appeared to. So yeah. it's an issue that was kind of widespread among other communities with their, their Greek thinking and everything, but it's right. still relevant today. So Yeah. Yeah, highly relevant today because you know, with with all the uh, the forensics and all, all the science and you know the possibility mm -hmm. of it, so the only way the only way to explain it is that it was truly the hand of God. It was a miracle. It was a hand of God. What we what we miss though is this gap on what you know what's a miracle and what's not a miracle. You know, I mean the 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 birth of a child that's a miracle. Right? I mean, it, it, we, I don't think that we have to get so deep into it's a, uh, that someone has to be raised from the dead and that we see them and they go up into heaven, you know, in, in full body. But that's what people seem to be looking for, right? Instead of just simply looking at some of the, some of the, what we consider the more simple things in nature are truly miracles and they still haven't been, they, with all the science and with all the knowledge, with all the technology, still haven't been recreated. Yep, Jim. You know, they, they always, uh, every so often, every so many years, they kind of drag out the shroud of turn and mm -hmm. yep. try to do uh, analysis. Carbon dating and all that, yeah. And their goal to try to be, to confirm that that was the shroud of Christ right. or not. But, yeah. but, you know, in the end, you've got to have faith that the, the science is going to be weak on There's this. There's still no explanation. No, no. Right. I think right. most of the time those tests were trying to prove that it wasn't. Right. Yeah. But it, yeah. Yeah. A yeah. lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, again, just give them the benefit of the doubt. They're just trying to prove, date it. You know, I mean, I don't know if they're trying to squash it or support it, but you know, I don't know. It doesn't change my doesn't change my belief of what occurred. 
even if there was no, if there was never a shroud found, right? That that, that doesn't change anything. And um, Paul gives, uh, Paul actually gives us uh, a glimpse into who those enemies might be. And it was one of the readings I think in First Corinthians twenty-two through twenty-four, uh, and he talks about it. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we proclaim. Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those those who are called Jews and Greeks alike, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So it's really that, I mean, he defi Paul defined it, as you said, in, in 1 Corinthians, said, here's who these people are, right? The Jews demand a sign and Greeks look for wisdom. So the Greeks were saying, can't happen. I mean, show, show me how this can happen. The Jews were saying, show me the sign. Okay, I hear what you're saying, but you saw it. I didn't see it. Where's the sign? You know, well, the sign will be at the, at the, clearly at the second coming, right? You know, and when, when, when the final judgment day comes. Uh, and then that will truly be a sign. So uh, their end is destruction. Their stomachs, uh, their stomach is their God, and they glorify in their shame. So the destruction will come when the end times comes. Judgment will reflect their choices to deny Christ. And we know that that's true because that's what we're taught. Uh, but can you explain the phrase, their God is their stomach? They put the comfort of this world ahead of everything. Right. There, it's, it's how am I satisfied today, right now, on the, on my, in, in this mortal world on earth, as opposed to what am I doing to satisfy and feed my soul for an eternal life in the kingdom? Right. And, you know, so that's, again, it's this tie to, you know, why, why do we have these, why do we have a reading like this during Lent? It's really as we look forward to the opportunity to, for the next kingdom. Um, what does their glory, as their shame mean? So I've kind of answered it. I mean, it's the, the things they glorify are really the sins that they should be ashamed of. And we see that today. There are so many people that, um, and, and, I, and, I, and I think, it's probably always going on. We see it now more just like some of the things we complain about. I think we take advantage of and use to our benefit as well, like the instant information and the Internet and all the everything and that we see. It's hard not to see it, right. and it's even harder not to judge. Yeah, right. So right. judging is just as simple as... Yeah, yeah, that... that you know, is it judgment or discernment? You know, are you determining if they're doing the right thing or are you judging and trying to punish? You know, there's truly, truly right or wrong, and we have, that, we have that sense of judgment. Everybody does. On, you know, it depends on where your bar is, right? On if they're, you know, or where your line is. If they're on this side, well, clearly they're not living right. If they're on this side, then, well, clearly they're living right. But does that always line up with, with this? You know, I don't know with me, maybe not so much, you know, I mean, I try, but I know that I have those failings, you know, so, it but it, we have to have that, we have to have that judgment in, in, in us so that we understand right from wrong for ourselves and for our families. So there's, a, there's a difference in judging whether they're doing right or wrong as to what, and to, to set our path forward rather than condemn them or praise them one way or the other. Right, yeah. Are we leading or are we or, or are we just throwing rocks over the wall? Right. Yeah. Is it just as sinful to think it as to say it? No, I mean I don't think I mean again it's right or I mean it's 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 what is a sin, not how much it's a sin. Well you're caught up on judging. I mean judging an action is not is bad. That, right. Judging an action is not bad. Judging someone's eternal destiny is not your job, but judging, that's punishment. The, judging the right and wrong of an action is yeah. everybody's job. We're, that, right, that's what I'm saying. We're, we're, we, if we didn't have that, then, we, then what would we have, right? Because we have to be able to make that determination. We've been given that. We've been given that gift and, and responsibility. Back to the children, you were talking about whatever before we got started, right? right. Okay, well, so if, you, if, if, if my child... I mean, not that they ever did anything wrong, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Good. So, so yeah. So when they did, it, when they did, I I knew that what they were doing was wrong. Was that judgment? Well, sure, it was. I mean, I I knew. I mean, so so we have that in us to, and we have that responsibility as parents, because our responsibility is to help them get to heaven, 
right? I mean, like the catechism says, I mean, that's what we are responsible to do first as parents is to teach them and bring them up in the way of the, the way of the Lord so that we help them get to heaven. Well, if we didn't have, if we couldn't judge what they were doing in their behavior, then there's no way we could direct and guide them and lead them in that path. Does that stop at 18? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. And if you think of it maybe more as discernment. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, judgment and discernment. Yeah. Judgment is, and discernment is well, different. Well, well. I'm not really, but, but you're trying to seek what is God's will, what is the right way in your actions, and also to guide your children. So that you're, you have a responsibility of discernment as a Christian. Well, um, you have a call to direct them into what is the established uh, norms of, of uh, uh, what we call good behavior, yeah, or proper right. behavior, yeah. or the way that will benefit them the most. Christian behavior. Yeah. Christian, as opposed to the way that's going to lead to destruction. And that discernment piece is what's the fact, I mean, for me, and that's why I like using that, you know, judgment, discernment, is, is to, what's my foundation for making that judgment? You know, is it this, or is it just because it's something that makes me feel good? You know, is, is it the word according to Alan, or is it the word according to God? You know, and really, that that's that's a big uh, for me. That's a significant difference, and that's that discerning and say, is this is is this is this right and true and correct, right? By something that I have a foundation for, or is it just the way I feel? You know, just the way I feel. So, um, uh, so we're gonna move on. Uh, because I'm, I'm running behind. So, no, that's okay. No, that's me. No, I could, yeah, anyway. So, but our citizenship is in heaven. So the citizenship that St. Paul speaks of is that of the Christians in heaven. Um, he's encouraging the church in Philippi to remain focused uh, and not be distracted by the false teachers. Um, and then uh, he will change our lowly bodies to conform with his glorified body. So af after we die, okay, at that, at that judgment day, um, so uh, we, we agree that we're going to leave our earthly bodies behind when we die. We've all witnessed that, okay? And we don't know what form we're going to take, but we, we have to believe that. So, so, so in Mark 16, 9, we're taught that Jesus was taken up into heaven to take his seat at the right hand of the Father, okay? I mean, this context kind of leads us to believe that there'll be some bodily form. I mean, there'll be something, you know, with the angels and cherubs. I mean, in the visions out of, uh, out of Revelations, I mean, that John speaks of. So we, we have to believe there's something, but we don't know what that is. I mean, there's, there's no way we can know. We can, all, we can imagine what that may be, but with that, we, but we are told here that we're going we're gonna to take on that glor some type of glorified body or form much like what Jesus is <clears throat> in heaven. We just don't, really, we don't, we don't know what that is yet. So, and then uh, again, this is, it's clear in this final verse uh, that he really loved uh, the Philippians, right? And, and he had a great deal of faith in them. There was a very, very close relationship there. Um, and so why do you think this reading was chosen for Lent? Uh, we touched upon it several times, yeah. And I think it reminds us where our real home is uh, and what where it's not. What we're working for. Right. Yeah, yeah, our goal. Right. Yeah, it's that, it's, it's that goal. It's that, um, it, the, you know, the passage begins um, with people not believing with, with um, not believing in the resurrection and the cross, right? Chapter 3 uh, does. And then it concludes with the promise of us, um, of, the re of us being part of that resurrection. Our souls some bodily form in whatever that looks like with Christ, okay? And, and so it's really very much, and for us to have to do that, I mean, for us to achieve that, we'll have to go through that death, okay, and some form of resurrection as well, right? So I'm, I'm certain it won't be in the same form, right? But we know that somehow there, that, that it will occur and that we have to have, we have, to have that faith. So, any questions before we move on to the gospel? Well, and then there's also the thought of getting rid of instant gratification and the material side and the, almost that role of fasting that does to your soul. Does it ever right. say how long after Christ died that this uh, Paul was writing? Uh, 
You can, uh, yeah, you can, yeah, I mean, there's a, there, there, chronologically, you can see it. I mean, it was in the first century, but I, I don't have it. I mean, 20 to 30 it. years. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Still, it 30, was hard. 40th it was, th th yeah, 30 or 40 at the tops, yeah. And yeah. still being in the same century or whatever. Generation. Was, yeah, it was, right. It was hard then to explain Jesus as our Savior. <clears throat> Yeah, more than a lot. I mean, there were people there were people still alive that had knew Jesus at that point. Yeah, during his writings. Yeah. Um, the uh, so um, since last week, um, the Galilean ministry of Jesus just began. Uh, is, is just begun after last week's reading from the gospel. Um, Jesus performed many miracles since then. Uh, the disciples have witnessed these and have been with him and are starting to get a better understanding of who Jesus is. Um, and then uh, Peter has professed to Jesus that he's the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And then uh, Jesus has also told his disciples about his first prediction of the Passion uh, and that he'll, he must be killed and rise on the third day. Um, so that's where we are when we get to this. So there's been a whole lot of things that have occurred. You know, he's fed the masses. He's cured, uh, eliminated the demonics. I mean, he's done many things and they've seen this. So... Um, so now today's gospel's account of the transfiguration of Jesus uh, occurs about one year before the Passion. Um, and it's found in, this story's found in all three of the synoptic gospels. John does not uh, give this account. Um, and, it, and it's interesting, the, uh, these three readings are immediately following the, the, the from uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, immediately uh, proceed the story of the transfiguration. And in all of them, it has, uh, it says, will not taste death, will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming. So there's some of you standing here, and this isn't with the group of his disciples plus others. Um, and he says, you know, in Luke, it says, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So um, they, there's no way they could understand what that means. Right? There, there's absolutely no way, no matter what their faith, whatever where they believe, even though Peter has already professed that he recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. So keep that in mind as we, as we go through the readings and our discussions today. So the gospel, uh, according to Luke, um, uh, Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. While he was praying, his face changed in appearance and his clothes became dazzling white. And behold, two men were conversing with him, Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions had been overcome by sleep, but becoming fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As they were about to part from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he did not know what he was saying. While he was still speaking, a cloud came and cast a shadow over them, and they became frightened when they entered the cloud. <coughs> then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my chosen son. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They fell silent and did not at the time tell anyone what they had seen. So what does transfiguration mean? Change. Right, yeah. So this is, this is a... It was a real simple definition out of a Merriam-Webster dictionary. It's a change in form of appearance, an exalting, glorifying, or spiritual change. So, and, and it's derived from the Latin roots, trans meaning across, like transatlantic, transcontinental, you go across something, and uh, figura meaning form or shape. So did that occur? Well, yeah, but by the definition and by the Latin root words. So Jesus' uh, appearance changed, his face changed in appearance, I mean, we know that. That's what it says. And then, um, and he was truly glorified. How? Because God glorified him by saying, this is my chosen son. Listen to him. And, and so, so, so real, simple, um, um, real simple definition, but um, what an amazing thing to witness or to occur. Because we say we see, you know, that person, you know, they, they, they transfigured, you know, they, they changed. It's been a transformation. You know, they, they, they've lost a bunch of weight. They, they've, whatever, whatever has occurred, right, in their, in their life, um, we, we see that change. This is, this is much, much different, right? This is much different than that. 
So um, what is the significance of Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah on the mountain? So, yeah, they represented the old law, right? They, 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 they represented the old covenant. covenant. The law that represented, Elijah represented the prophets. He was, no, he was understood as the most important prophet, the most significant prophet. Uh, and um, the, uh, Moses represented the law. Right. He brought us the law from, from God. Well, was Question. it that God didn't want Moses or didn't let him cross the Jordan? What was the reason? He had done something wrong? Or what was it? Yeah. Well, he, he, he struck the rock twice for water. And that doesn't look like such a, a, a major thing to do, but he... Um, he doubted God. Uh, he did it in anger. He did it in anger. He did it in anger. Yep. And it was really um, an affront to God and his relationship with God and for the people to see him react like that uh, to God in front of them. That was just um, not But still, not good. he's there on the mountain. Right. He's still considered the lawgiver. Um, right. And a leader in that but he was fallible because he was a man, mm -hmm. right? Moses was fallible. He was a man and he questioned God and he was not, and he was, Moses wanted it in his time, right? Not in God's time, right? It's that, you know, even though, even though that trend, it went for so long, they were still looking for, in their world, instant gratification. We want it now. You know, where is all the milk and honey now, right? Where's this promised land now, right? You know, and, and so... We, we, it's a good question, I think, and, and a good point to bring up because we still have to pursue that eternal life, right? Not everything's going to be milk and honey for us, as we know, right? So, um, and then yeah. this was a physical shift from the old covenant to the new covenant, right? Yep, you know, know, you have the three of them there together showing a, uh, there is a unity there, even though Jesus fulfills it. The, yeah. the, old, the prophets... Oh yeah, they were. They were. Yeah, there was some. Um, uh, yeah, agreement, right? A agreement, a kind of a passing of the torch, if it were. Uh, ver verse uh, thirty-one refers to the three of them speaking of Jesus Exodus from Jerusalem. What's this a reference to? Crucifixion. Yes, yeah, crucifixion, crucifixion, and resurrection and ascension, right? Uh, so, so that this is that uh, this is that the, the the foreshadowing. Of, uh, of the event of the Passion to come, which is still uh, over a year away. Um, you think that the three disciples understood what they had just witnessed? Evidently yeah. not. No, of course not. I mean, how, how could they? I mean, it, it would be impossible. You know, in Mark and Matthew, it says they didn't understand. You know, and then clearly Peter, you know, Luke says, Peter didn't know what he was talking about, right? He wanted to build three tents. And so why, why, do, you think, why do you think he wanted to do that? Exactly. He wanted to stay up on the mountain. He wanted that high. And what, how special was that, right? That here it's the three of them, the, the three witnesses, okay, all right, and Jesus and Moses and Elijah. I mean, who would want to go, come on, i got stuff to do. I've got chores. We need to get back down the mountain, you know. No, I mean, they wanted to, they wanted to live. Peter wanted to live and stay in that moment. Um, and then, um, so uh, why, do, why do you think, that Jesus brought the three with him. I mean, couldn't the transfiguration have occurred without him being present? I mean, if his face truly changed and he truly had this glow when he came back down the mountain, people had to notice. It's almost like he was hoping that they would get it. Uh, Continuity with the old covenant, the new. With Deut in Deuteronomy, right? The law. You need if if in life or death situations, you needed two or three witnesses, and this was that. This was that death, right, of Christ, the mortal man, that they, the, the prophet, right, in that stepping over and, and across that transfiguration of him into truly the Son of God. How do we know that? Because God said, this is my chosen son, listen to him. And can you think of a similar, a similar statement in the Gospels no. that occurred? Well, yes. baptism. Baptism. baptism, right, baptism. Okay, and, and what else? Right? The okay. wedding at Cana. Right? Mary says, okay, all right, do what he says. 
right? He says, you know, which is the same, listen to him. So, I mean, what, what a great, what, what a great um, reminder during this Lenten season maybe to take a little more time and to listen, right, and to, to listen to God. So, um, so here in, uh, the, in Matthew and Mark's gospel accounts, the transfiguration, um, the, the disciples are, are told specifically, don't tell anyone, right, until he's risen from the dead. That doesn't occur here. In, in Luke's gospel, right? And so, so we have to believe it's, it's somehow understood that they're not supposed to, right? Okay, and then um, Luke's gospel account omits their trip down the mountain. So it's really interesting. I'm not gonna go into it right now because of the time, but if you go back and read the, the those stories, it's a little different because he talks about Elijah and talks about the second coming and then the lead in and understanding of is that John the Baptist or not, you know, but that he truly did come, but he did not, he wasn't listened to. They didn't. People haven't completely believed him. So, um, why do you think that this reading was chosen for Lent? Well, it shows his fulfillment as the Son of God and what his mission is going to be and what he is. He is on the road to what, what his destination is. Right. And yeah. Fulfilling that role as the Son of God. And yeah, and that Exodus discussion is really about the the the. What's going to come? The, the death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven um, as he moves as he moves on. So our key takeaways today: the first reading detailed a covenant that was a promise of physical land, a kingdom of physical land in our mortal world that that the descendants would have. And we're there, as we said, still fighting over this physical land uh, uh, today. Uh, the second reading reminds us what it takes to be a citizen in that kingdom of God. Right? And, and to not maybe focus so much on what's going on here at home and what the possessions are, but what we hope to possess one day. And then the gospel reading gives us a glimpse of that new covenant, right? The promise of what an eternal life in the kingdom of God, not here on this earth. And so it's really that, that transformation, that movement from the physical to the afterlife and an eternal life in heaven. So Because any, they were taught that there was no eternal life before then in the laws that um, yeah, but they, no, the, the Pharisees the Hebrews, believed yeah. in us. The Pharisees uh, believed. The Sadducees did not. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, yeah, yeah. And the Pharisees were the majority. Right, okay. right, yeah. Okay, um, let's close with, uh, uh, with the Hail Mary. <coughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, Hail Mary. Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thou womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank y'all. Thank you. Very good.